Good morning, Pastor Ed Kropa here from Hope Lutheran Church in Freehold, New Jersey, with daily devotions for Monday, November the 9th, 2020. Welcome as we begin a new week of our daily devotions, focusing this week on being alert for the arrival of the Lord. In Old Testament times, there was anticipation of the so-called Day of the Lord, when all of Israel's enemies and, and foes would be vanquished. But by the time of the New Testament, with the belief that God had already come into our midst through Jesus Christ, that anticipation was now focused on Christ's triumphant return at the end of time. This morning's reading, you will notice, is the passage that I preached on in church yesterday, Amos 5, verses 18 to 24. And so some of this will undoubtedly be familiar to those of you who participated in our live streaming service or watched it later online. The context for this morning's passage is that the people of Amos's time were actually looking forward to the day of the Lord, thinking that their religious devotion was sufficient to protect them from their indifference to the lack of justice in their society and to the plight of those less fortunate than themselves. They were sadly mistaken, however. Amos preached sometime around the year 750 B.C., and sadly his message of judgment was fulfilled a few decades later in 722, when the Assyrians evaded, invaded and conquered the northern kingdom of Israel, a defeat from which the nation never did recover. A cautionary tale, to be sure, for all those who would lose sight of their need to strive for justice and righteousness in their lives and in their society. Before we be continue our discussion, however, let's begin as we always do with the service of responsive prayer, namely the Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and Martin Luther's Morning Prayer. Let us begin. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal, have mercy on us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have protected us through the night from all harm and danger. We ask that you would also protect us today from sin and all evil, so that our life and actions may please you. Into your hands we commend ourselves, our bodies, our souls, and all that is ours. Let your holy angels be with us, so that the wicked foe may have no power over us. Amen. Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Once again, our reading this morning is Amos chapter 5, verses 18 to 24. Alas, for you who desire the day of the Lord, why do you want the day of the Lord? It is darkness, not light, as if someone fled from a lion and was met by a bear, or went into the house and rested a hand against the wall and was bitten by a snake. Is not the day of the Lord darkness, not light, and a gloom with no brightness in it? I hate I despise your festivals, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters, and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Amos is reminding the people of his day, and again, he actually lived in the south, but he did business up in the north, and, and he was preaching to the northern kingdom of Israel, which, as I said, only a few decades later fell because they didn't 
they didn't heed the warning. They were complacent, overconfident. Um, they may have said and did the right things, but obviously their actions didn't support the words. And, and so the idea of justice and righteousness figures so strongly, well, throughout the entire Bible, but certainly in this passage as well. Um, and, a, and a reminder that, that what we do really matters. It's not just what we say. I, I'm reminded of uh, some of the clashes. I think there was a famous one down in Alabama, a fight over whether the, the Ten Commandments could be, be displayed in the courthouse. And there was back and forth about that, whether that was proper or not. And it always struck me that some of the people who put so much um, uh, into that argument, you know, um, in some cases may have, maybe would have benefited from actually following the commandments. I'm reminded of that story from Mark Twain. I think I used it back when we looked at the Ten Commandments a number of weeks ago. Uh, the, the man, the wealthy gentleman who said to Mark Twain, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to travel to the Holy Land. I'm going to go up on Mount Sinai and read the Ten Commandments up there. And Mark Twain said, well, maybe it'd be better if you just stayed home and kept them instead. Uh, so again, our actions um, mean something. They're important. They, they need to be in line and consistent with the things that we say. There's so many stories of, of injustice. We, we hear them uh, all the time. I, I, one of my guilty pleasures is watching some of these, you know, Dateline and 2020, and, and, and they'll have stories about miscarriages of, of justice. Um, uh, I came across a story of a, in 1984, a particular person was killed or, or actually convicted in the 1982 brutal murders of um, this woman and children and her grandchild. However, uh, two years later, the Illinois Appellate Court overturned the conviction, even as the justices who were doing this acknowledged that he was almost certainly guilty, but they said the police had arrested him without probable cause and conducted an illegal search, and so they therefore threw out virtually all the evidence against him. So he was eventually released from prison uh, after his listen to this, parole from another offense. Um, but two decades later, after his murder conviction was overturned, he was arrested again uh, for the murder of a, a woman who worked at a local Burger King. Um, you know, as I said in my sermon, what's legal um, and what's just are not necessarily uh, the same things. And so we need to be advocates for justice um, not just legality. Uh, I quoted Martin Luther King. Here's another in my sermon. Here's another one. Our lives begin to end that the day the day we become silent about things that matter. Our lives begin to end when we become silent about the things that matter. I also used a quote from Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Uh, if you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. Um, the second half of that quote is, if an elephant has his foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you're neutral, the mouse will not appreciate your neutrality, said Bishop Tutu. So justice and then also righteousness. We, we attribute ultimately justice and righteousness to God, and that becomes the, the standard by which we then um, try to live and strive for, however imperfectly and most assuredly imperfectly. Uh, in this world. Um, it's been pointed out that uh, in Washington, D.C., there's a, a, uh, a building called the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, it's responsible for storing perfect examples of the various weights and measurements. Um, they have what are called prototypes of, of pound weights and kilograms and, and measuring rods for feet and yards and, and metric measurements like meters. So, for example, they have a meter standard, which is a reinforced bar of platinum alloyed, of platinum alloyed with exactly 10% iridium. And when they want to know the exact measurement of a meter, they cool the bar down to zero degrees Celsius at sea level of 45 degrees latitude. Then they know that they'll have the exact tip-to-tip -tip measurement of a meter. Well, as has been pointed out, when it comes to righteousness, the authoritative standard is God himself. And therefore, biblical righteousness means to have a life that conforms to the holy character of God. Back in the um, early 19th century, around 1830 or so, uh, the French writer Alexis de Tocqueville came and he was, he was very intrigued by 
the United States, which was emerging at that point, of course, as, a, as an up-and-coming uh, nation and ultimately world power. Um, and he wrote extensively about his travels and what he learned. And at one point he said, I sought for the greatness of the United States in her commodious harbors, her ample rivers, her fertile fields and boundless forests, and it was not there. I sought for it in her rich mines, her vast world commerce, her public school system, and in her institutions of higher learning, and it was not there. I looked for it in her democratic congress, in her matchless constitution, and it was not there. Not until I went into the churches of America and heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, said de Tocqueville, America will cease to be great. Something, something to think about. Um, are we guilty um, of the very same kind of thing that the people in Amos's day were? Uh, of enjoying a booming economy and all these perks, but a big divide between the haves and the have-nots, uh, a lot of injustice, uh, a lot of of problems in terms of not taking care of the least. Biblical justice always had to do with taking care of the least in society, the most, the weakest and most vulnerable, the widows and the orphans. That gets repeated. That those those two groups in particular get repeated over and over again, uh, because they don't can't defend themselves. They have no means of doing so. So society needs to take care of the least of these. And Jesus, of course, later on said, As you did unto the least of these my disciples, you did unto uh, my brothers and sisters, you did unto me. Um, so justice and righteousness. There's a, there's a Chinese po proverb that goes like this. If there is righteousness in the heart. Okay, so that's apparently where it starts. If there's righteousness in the, in the heart, there will be beauty in the character. And if there's beauty in the character, there will be harmony in the home. And if there's harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation. And if there's order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. In other words, at least according to that Chinese proverb, it all begins with righteousness. It builds from righteousness. From righteousness to beauty to character and harmony and order and then ultimately peace. Let us pray. Righteous God, help us to be ready for the time Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead and to anticipate the end of the age with joy. Amen. Well, I hope you have a great start to your week. Looking forward, as always, to getting together with you again tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.